Our thoughts this afternoon are entitled, How Do You Know You Have the Truth? You know, this is a relevant question whether you're 99 or 18 or 15. How do you know you have the truth? And especially if you're young and you're searching and proving and trying to figure out, how do you know you have the truth? We're going to look at what the scriptures have to say about this. You know, this was Jesus' mission statement. And we find it in John 18, 37. For this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. That was really his mission statement. That's, that's why he came here, and we understand the mechanics and all of that, but this was his mission to bear witness to the truth. And as a result, you know, we often refer to ourselves, or we are referred to as truth people. What does exactly does that mean? Well, we're going to see. You know, if we are looking at religions, well, there are thousands of religions, aren't there? And you can find elements of good living, elements of, you know, proper behavior and character in almost every one of these, but which one has the truth? Well, of course, we would say that it is Christianity, but even amongst Christianity, there's over a thousand different denominations and sects. And with that, you say, well, how do you know you got the truth? Out of all of these thousands of denominations. Well, the good news is the scriptures actually tell us. And that was kind of the basis of this talk. I was, I was doing some studying and I came across statements that said, wow, that's a criteria that says if you understand this or if you see this or if you hear this, the scriptures themselves are defining that you understand the truth. Are you interested? I know I was. There are keys to understanding truth. And these are, I'm going to give you the first the scriptural premises, and the scriptures themselves describe these premises. And I will tell you, once, if you use this as a foundation, then we can go on to look at other Bible proofs that directly tell us. Now, why is this important? Well, if you're a young person and you're searching, you're proving things, and then you have confidence, which builds into faith. And if we're older, it confirms our understanding and it confirms our faith in God to where it is really solid as a rock. And so whether we're young or old, new in the truth, or been in the truth for 75 years, these are important things to us. Just a few scriptures to help set one of the premises. Matthew 7, 14, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This is not the message of Christendom. They're trying to save the world right now, and this is contrary to that, isn't it? And in fact, when you read it on its surface, it seems strange. So the Bible's all about giving the truth, but not many people are going to find it. At least not yet. Continuing another scripture in Acts 28, 27, for the people, for the heart of the, this people is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes have they closed. It's talking about the Jews. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. This seems completely contrary, doesn't it? So he was saying their ears were dull so that they would not understand because it wasn't yet their time. It was not yet their time to be converted. But once again, this is showing that the majority are not going to see the truth, even those among Christendom. This kind of sets a base level. What is the expectation? If the expectation is we're proselytizing the world, we're winning them over, and we're going to bring in God's kingdom, 
Well, that's not what this is saying. It's saying there's going to be a select few that will hear. Now, where this is important, especially for our young people, is to realize my beliefs are, as I put it when I first met my wife before I was in the truth, kind of strange. They're different. They're not lined up with nominal Christendom. Continuing, 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to, unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And I think what this is saying is you could read them and get a surface comprehension, but you can't put them to heart unless you're spiritually discerning. And we realize that's a process as well. This is what the scriptural account says. This is the expectation. And this is important because if we think that I'm going to go witness to somebody and I'm going to win them over every time and that we're going to get more and more, that's a wrong expectation. This is a select group. That's what the scriptures are saying. That's not what we're saying. And that's not an excuse that we don't have burgeoning thousands of people here. That actually should be an affirmation to us that we are a little flock. In 1 Corinthians 2.9, I hath not seen nor ear, hear, have ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now this is an expectation that even with our knowledge of God's plans and purposes, it's only the beginning. The best is yet to come. And it's going to be better than we can possibly imagine. That's the expectation. Even for the spirit begotten, we realize there's so much more to follow, but the Lord is providing enough to build our faith, to confirm our belief in the scriptures, to transform our hearts so that we can be overcomers. That's what's necessary. So, one of the basic premises of the truth, as defined in scriptures, is most people are not going to understand. So don't be disconcerted if you get odd looks when you witness to somebody about the kingdom, or about the ransom, or about the resurrection. You know, I had a, uh, a business trip with three other individuals that I work with, and we were all pretty amiable. We were all Christians. One was a fundamentalist, one was a Baptist, and one was a Methodist. And we were talking about tithing. Interesting subject, right? Well, the, the Methodist said they gave. The, uh, the, you, you know, we went down the line and they came to me and they said, well, how much do you give? <laughs> and the answer was everything. And they, what do you mean? And you know what I mean because we give, or at least we try to give our all. What is needed? I had another boss, my, my boss, and I would ask for leave. And I'd say, I'm going to the Seattle Convention. And I need, you know, five days off. And finally, after doing this for general, for convention after convention after convention, his comment was, you ought to find a church nearby. <laughs> he didn't get it. And that's okay. That's the expectations. Don't be distressed because your coworkers or your friends don't get it, and they look at you a little strange. In fact, before I came into the truth through marriage, and... My wife, for while I was in college, lived across the street. And what my grandparents said was, they're really good people, but they've got a little bit strange religion. That's a pretty good description. You're all peculiar people. Your beliefs are strange. But that's what the scriptures say. So don't be distressed by that fact. That should be actually a confirmation. Continuing. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. God is saying here, he's going to reveal things to you if you approach him in love and dedication. And in Matthew, he says, 
it is given unto you to understand the mystery or to, or to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the kingdom of heaven, if you go to a JW, they'll, they'll give you their spin on it. But most Christians don't have a concept of what the kingdom is. We were visiting my relatives in Wisconsin when I was many years younger. And the, none of them, they're all Catholic, so none of them... Uh, or have any idea of what we believed and we were sitting around and they were talking about how the whole world's you know going down and my wife said well at least God has a plan the looks we got like what are you talking about understand brethren a lot of these things are foreign and that's okay because the scriptures tell us they're not going to understand but these scriptures are describing who will understand. In the process, they are identifying those who are of a right heart condition and that are approaching God. He that giveth wisdom unto the wise, he giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. This is a promise. How do you get them? Well, you have to study. You have to meditate. You have to pray. You have to consecrate to get the full measure. But he's saying he's going to reveal these things, not to the masses, but to some. His secret is with the righteous. And now he's identifying who is going to understand. Those that are continually you know, going to God in prayer, that are asking forgiveness when they fall short, and praying for a fuller measure of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul in Colossians 1, 26 and 27, this is Weymouth, the truth which has been kept secret from all ages and generations. Guess what? This is not a new thing, that this is not obvious to everybody. This has been a secret through the ages. And if you look, I think Brother Tim Krupa gave a discourse a number of years back on the church in the Middle Ages. And he traced this little thread of believers that didn't believe in a, a hateful, meanful, vengeance God all the way through, but it was a little thread. So it's been secret in all ages. Now we're setting the expectations so you realize this is a, I've got a secret. Most people aren't going to know it, and I'm not going to tell them. Well, I will tell them, but they're not going to hear it. It's going to be revealed to his people to whom it was his will to make known the vast wealth of his glory. The riches of his glory is King James. The vast wealth of his glory. So you're going to see, you know, there's no more wonderful picture than to say, God has a plan and everybody is in it. All inclusive. Wow. That's the riches and we only know, we only have a glimpse at this time. Of what that means. So we're told that God's people will understand. So most will not. And God's people will. If we don't understand and don't have these premises, then we're not going to be able to discern what is truth. Because we're looking at the wrong place in the wrong time and so forth. In the divine plan of the ages on, in the forward, on page 11, believing that the scriptures reveal a consistent and harmonious plan, which when seen must commence itself to every sanctified conscience. This work is published in the hope of assisting students of the word of God by suggesting lines of thought which harmonize with each other and with the inspired word of God. How do we know God is a God of harmony? Well, I know Mark Davis was a pilot. He used his knowledge in physics of the plane to fly that plane. We use our knowledge to do the stove. And consistently, if you turn the stove on, it comes on. And consistently, if you approach at this angle, you're able to land. So there is a tremendous harmony, and the heavens move in a consistent way that men have known about for eons. 
God is a God of consistency and harmony. And that continues even into his word. And that's what the pastor was saying here. For, as it says in Psalm 133 too, for harmony is as precious as the anointing oil which was poured over Aaron's head. This is also saying that, you know, an allusion to the Holy Spirit, right? Oil, that there's a harmonious whole here. So many have inter interpreted the Bible, but it doesn't harmonize. They have accentuated something, and, and many of us have changed our minds when we see things that don't harmonize in the Bible. So it's saying that God's plan is harmonious. So when you hold it up to the litmus test, you have to realize it's got to harmonize. And if it doesn't, you have to look and study deeper as to what's being meant. Again in Colossians, the truth which has been kept secret from all ages and generations. And it's called in 1 Corinthians, for we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, a hidden, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So this is key as well. Why doesn't everybody see it when I witness? I do a great job, and they don't hear. Have you ever had that experience? It falls on deaf ears. It's because many of these things are a mystery. Now, the wonderful thing about this label is when I tell you it's a mystery, that's what the scriptures say, we can start chasing down mysteries in the scriptures. The mysteries of God. You know, 1 Corinthians it describes that we would become stewards. You know what a steward is? That's someone that takes care of something. They're entrusted with it. They protect it. They embrace it. They support it. We're stewards of the mysteries of God. And so this is also identifying who would be able. Now, why this is important, because we're going to go through mysteries, and I'm going to ask you if you understand this mystery. This is the scriptures telling and affirming for you. If you understand this, the scriptures are indicating you are one of those stewards because you understand these things. You know, even in Revelation 10, 7, we read, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he, hath, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as declared unto his saints. Not quite yet. But it's saying this mystery is close to being complete. And it has been declared and understood by his servants. So the truth is hidden in mysteries. I've got a secret. Do you want to know about it? You know, this is a mystery. I want to know when there's a mystery, what's the secret? And let's see what the Bible has to say. And once again, the world's not going to see this. Your friends at school are not going to see this necessarily. Do you understand the mysteries in the scriptures? Number one, Romans 12, 12. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We call that the new creature mind. That ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice there's a proving process here. It's not that you just read it. You know, so many times at school we would read something and memorize it, and I couldn't tell you what it was two months later. But it's saying we study and we understand the will of God. Well, what is this will of God? In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4, it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. How many of our Christian friends understand sacrifice, suffering, and sanctification. And the requirement for it, in fact, we joyfully do it as a part of our vow. Continuing, Ephesians 1.8, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation in the fullness of times he might gather together all things in one in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. Do you understand that mystery? It's kind of coded language, isn't it? And yet, 
if we've studied, if we've proved, if we have the, the Holy Spirit, we realize the implications of that bringing together the Christ, head and body, heaven and earth, ultimately to bless all the families of the earth. And in Ephesians 5.31, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Do you understand this concept of Christ and the church? The Christ, head and body. That's what he's saying. This is a mystery to the world, and it's a mystery in scripture, but he's saying, this will be revealed unto my servants. So do I understand the mystery of his will? Do I understand the mystery of the kingdom? Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. In Luke it says, unto you is given to know the mysteries, plural, of the kingdom of God. But to others in parables, that seeing they might see and hearing they might not understand. Once again now, that's confusing language. Why is it saying that? So, so I'm revealing this mystery, but they're not going to see you and they're not going to understand. If we have the premise that most are not going to understand, we understand this scripture. And we harmonize it. You see the necessity of those premises. We have to harmonize and we have to uh, really dig down deep. So the mystery of the kingdom of God. Another one is uh, we find in Ephesians 1, 17, 18, and 22. Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, indicating that it's done through the Holy Spirit, that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that ye might know what is the hope of his calling. And then continuing on down, what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance of his saints? Do you understand that mystery? God is affirming for you that you, are, you have the truth. And if you can answer yes to all of these, it's a pretty strong affirmation. You have the truth. It's right there in black and white. And why doesn't everybody see that? Well, they're really not interested or they haven't been called. So that's the mystery of the high calling. Do you understand that? Continuing, the call of life and immortality. In 2 Timothy, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, but according to his own purpose and grace, <clears throat> but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light. Do you understand life and immortality? This is an indication from the scriptures that you are one of those servants. Continuing in Psalm 25, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And this is reverential fear. This is not scared fear or anything like that. And he will show them his covenant. God's going to show his servants this secret, which is covenant. Psalm 50 and 5, gathered to me my consecrated ones. I read it according to New International because rather than saints, it says consecrated ones. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Do you understand what the covenant by sacrifice is? The scriptures describe that his servants would understand this. The vision. Through faith, we understand that, God, that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And in Habakkuk, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. At the end, we're in the end, it shall speak. And it did speak exactly on time. And we traditionally look at the chart of the ages, which is the plan of God. That vision of the worlds was published 
right after the pastor began his full ministry. So do you understand the mystery of the vision? You could say the chart, the plan of the ages. God is indicating his servants would understand these things. So the Bible defines what would be understand, understood. The will of God, the kingdom, the high calling, life and immortality, his covenant, and the vision. But there's more. Why speakest unto them in parables? This is a question. And this is really, you know, if you, unless you have that premise, this doesn't make any sense. He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the king, kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not get, given. And why? For whosoever hath, it shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him it shall be taken away. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they see it. Seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, and they do not understand. How do you harmonize that? Because straight is the gate, narrow the way, and few there be that find it. Now, on the surface, this might give one the impression that God's leaving all out except for these few, but we realize the vision is much greater than that that this is not the time to convert the world, and that's why they're not seeing now. So let's look at the parables. The parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the leaven, the parable of the hidden treasure, the parable of the costly pearl. And you notice all of these parables of the kingdom are in Matthew 13. And of course, that's our go-to place, right, for these parables, in the parable of the dragnet. So let me ask you, do you understand that the Logos came down and that the man, Christ Jesus, redeemed Adam's race? I think all of us in here would. Do you understand that the kingdom of God will encompass the entire world? We can say earth, but it's the heavens and the earth. Do you understand that? Do you understand that the called are told to spend all they have in their consecrations? Do you understand that the gospel attracted many, and at the end, the good and the bad will be separated? Do you understand that a little sin, sin will corrupt your entire character? Do you understand that Satan deceives and distracts, but in spite of that, the elect will bring forth fruit? And did you understand that Satan tried to corrupt, but the harvest will reveal the true wheat? Well, guess what? <laughs> if you understand those things, you understand the, the real conclusions of those parables. And unto you is given to understand these deep things, the mysteries, the parables, and the will of God. So we understand the parables of the mysteries of the kingdom. And so we'll add that to our list as well. How are we doing? You know, this is really interesting as we looked at it. And that's why I developed this, this study was the Bible affirms what the servants will understand. This is self-affirming. So if you understand and harmonize these things, it's saying you're part of that servant class. You have the truth. But blessed are your eyes for they, for they see and your, your ears for they hear. For verily I have said unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them. And to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Many prophets, many righteous have desired now, sometimes, especially those approaching consecration might say, what am I giving to the Lord? I just don't feel I have anything to offer. But if the Lord calls you, if he pricks your ear, if you're drawn to the truth, the Lord has said, I want you. There's prophets, there were righteous men, 
that didn't have that happen. So this is not about self-worth. The Lord said, you have the right character, that you can be used in my service. And you say, I don't have talents. But you will. There are no zero-talent brethren, period. Why? Why does God give us an understanding of all these things? God provides full disclosure to those who are spirit begotten. You've seen the ads on the TV, and they have lots of, especially car ads, they'll have a lot of tiny print, or they get the guy at the end that talks so fast you can't understand what he's saying. God gives full disclosure, and not only that, but he won't accept you into this relationship unless you are capable of fulfilling your vow. So don't doubt yourself. If God calls you, you are capable. And if you fulfill your vows, you will receive a crown of life. That's guaranteed. Absolutely guaranteed. Those who understand these mysteries really can transition from book knowledge and head knowledge into, into hope, into faith. And a faith that is based on firm foundations. Because the scriptures define these foundations and guess what? If you ever doubt, if you have a clear view on the ransom or the resurrection, the scriptures are affirming what you will understand. Do you have the truth? You know, here is a micro SD card. We took a lot of these to Africa because we could bring an entire uh, library of 100 feet of books over there on this one tiny card. They could put it in their phone. Do you have the truth? Well, the truth is on this micro SD card, but it's the, absolutely the wrong question. The answer is, or the question is, does the truth have you? Because if you have the truth, it's just saying it's in here. But if it has you, then it's integral to your life. It motivates you. It's part of your essence. It's your passion in life. Does the truth have you? It goes along with the Bible principle. For unto whosoever much is given of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask much more. You know, there's a statement in the world, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. Are we busy Christians? That's what this is saying. He wants to give it to the, to the profitable servants. So regardless of how many talents you are, be profitable. That's part of the deal. In 1 Corinthians, Paul kind of frames this up. So now he said, well, you know all of these things. You've taken them to heart. You have them intellectually. You have solid faith. But he says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. If we don't make this transition from a solid faith to love, the manifestation of the character of Christ, we're nothing. So it's not enough just to have it here. We have to change it into a heart condition. In Colossians 2, this is New Loving Translation. This is what God wants to have happen. I, this is the Apostle Paul, I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for the many believers. He was thinking about them. He was praying about them. What did he want? Number one, I want them to be encouraged and knit together and with strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
And this would be our desire for each and every one of us. So when you go back to your home ecclesia, make sure that your home ecclesia is a, an ecclesia where brethren are encouraged and where they are nourished and where they see examples of love. And you might say, well, my ecclesia is not exactly like that. God is saying, you are empowered. It's your responsibility. But more than that, it's your privilege to be a role model of these attributes. And this is what the Lord wants. He wants our ecclesias to be wonderful, nourishing environment that encourage and bring up those that are coming up and comfort those that may be you know, elderly or infirmed or going through difficult trials. So enlightenment is intellectual. There's a component there, but it also requires action. In Ephesians 6.19, the Apostle Paul wrote, I may open my mouth boldly, and he did, to make known the mystery of the gospel. What is this saying to us? Despite the fact that we're not going to necessarily be taken seriously, despite the fact that our witnessing may fall on deaf ears, it's like, let's go boldly and profess this gospel. This is that glorious gospel of the kingdom that shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And once that's done, then shall the end come. The end is waiting on you and it's waiting on me. That work is not yet done. Almost, but not yet. We see the day approaching. We thank our Heavenly Father. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen.